the living word. Jesus was the epitome, the incarnate living word. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, comes and lives in each of us. And when we allow him lordship in our life, we become his living word. The problem is character development. Any of y'all struggle with character development? You know, if not, uh, let me encourage you to let God's word speak. And you will find, as I'm sure every one of us that is honest will find, God still has a lot of work to do on us, right? This morning, a message entitled, Nine Steps to Godly Character. For you see, godly character is not something that you just can be on your own. It's something that God has to craft in you. And so, when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been down dealing with the crowds. He's ministered to them. He's given healing. He's fed them. And, and he withdraws himself up on the mountain. Now, I love how the message puts this. It says that mountain climbers or mountain seekers go with him up to the mountain. You know, everyone's not willing to climb up the mountain and to sit at the feet of Jesus and be fed not with food, but with spiritual food. And so when he opens it up, he says the crowds, he went, after he administered the crowds, he went up on the mountain and sat down, and his disciples came to him. All of the mountain climbers came to him, and he began to teach them. And I would encourage you today to open your hearts and open your minds and begin to receive some adventurous and some courageous things that God would have you both to hear and to do if we're going to be people of godly character. He opens this section by saying, blessed. Blessed is not so much something that you feel or something that you think you possess. It's something that God says about you because of how you live. I want to say that again. It's something God says about you because of how you live. And what I want you to do is look at these nine things today and see if you are living the godly life. And in what area do you need improvement? Do I need improvement in living the godly life today? So join me as we enter the teaching of Jesus in what is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed. Now, the first three fall in a group that is categorized, blessed are those who are willing to be humble. You know, I think of that humorous song that uh, country writers, you know, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. You know, so many of us would not embrace that we're perfect in every way, but quite often we think more of ourselves than we should. Instead of having a poor in spirit issue, we have a pride issue. And he's calling us from the pride of humanity to the poor in spiritness that lies in the character of this first attitude. And notice they are called what? B attitudes. It's not what you do, it's what you be. Not good English, but good theology. What is it that you be? Do you find yourself sometimes so wrapped up in doing that you forget how to be? Be. And God is concerned about our being. And he says, blessed, or the state of being that he pronounces upon us, is there in godly character of humility when we are poor in spirit. That means that we recognize in ourselves the need for personal improvement. We realize that we are not all that God wants us to be, and we can't be what God wants us to be apart from Him. Now, this isn't some kind of impoverished peace. This isn't an absence of material wealth. This is an absence of spiritual perspective. 
And I can promise you, like the Apostle Paul, who is probably the greatest figure in the New Testament, next to Christ himself, when he got to the end of his days and he looked at life and his struggles in these areas, he said, sinner of whom I'm chief. Because he had that spirit of humility. Or David, a man after God's own heart. Courageous men, great men. These are the men that are characterized and cited as being poor in spirit. Not poor in effort, not poor in leadership, not poor in godliness, but poor because they recognize who they are in the presence of a holy God. Poor in spirit. And when we are poor in spirit, it says, then the rule and the reign of God, that's what the kingdom means. The rule and the reign of God becomes ours in our life. Now, the second thing about humility that he says, he says, blessed are those who who mourn. Now, these are not people that are grieving. These are not people that have loss in their life or have had massive losses in their life. No, these are people who mourn because of their spiritual impoverishment. Now, very close in realizing these first three are all about the same thing. It's about humility. He simply says that if we are going to be aware of who and what we are before God and in a spirit that is contrite and we seek to have God in our life to make us better than we are these first two. And so the first one, we get the kingdom of God. The second, we get comfort. Isn't it great to know to come to the end of your days that all you can sing in praise is just like these songs we just sang, you know. You know, you died for me. You've given me the possibility of being with you. There is comfort for those of us who will engage in a spirit to realize that without God, there's never enough of us. And then the third is blessed are the meek. The word meek is almost synonymous in our culture with weak. But I want to tell you that is not at all what it means. In fact, literally in the Hebrew, I love learning this in one of my first theology classes, meek means saddle broken. Take the huge energy of a massive stallion put a bit in its mouth and control and harness that energy. So if you just nudge it to the left, it turns left. If you just nudge it to the right, it turns right. If you pull back just a little bit, it'll stop on a dime. It will take its full force and be governed by the one who steers it. Are you like that in your life? Are you so disciplined and focused on who and what God is that when he says right, you turn right. When he says left, you turn left. When it says stop, you stop. Does God have the giftedness and the skills of your life totally focused on his direction? You see, to do that, you have to be humble and so Jesus said, I put the pronouncement of blessedness, of joy and peace in the inner man on those who are willing to be humble. In fact, when you do, you inherit the earth. You inherit all that God intended for you to have as his creation in his history. Well, the second section is... Just one of the Beatitudes, but it is ever so significant. We move to the fourth, and it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are the people that are not only holy, I mean humble, but also holy. Holy, we know, is that which is set apart, that which is unique for God. And so when it says you hunger and your thirst is the desire in your life to be right wise, to do what is good and wholesome, to do what is approving in him, is that your major focus and desire? How is your godly character in desiring to be right before God and before others and within yourself? When we have a hunger and thirst for that and it's what drives us to feed what we feed to ourselves, to drink in what we drink in for ourselves, then he says, those folks will be filled. Those folks will be filled. We move to the third section. The third section has to do with using both our humility and our holiness to become helpful to 
to others. Isn't it interesting that God always takes us from salvation to grow in spiritual depths in order that we might what? Be helpful to other people. In order that we might serve. The outcome of salvation and God's sanctifying process in your life and mine is always service. And so he says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are forgiven and can be forgiving. Blessed are those who receive mercy and can give mercy. I'm reminded of the story where Jesus said, unless you forgive your brother, you'll in no wise be forgiven yourself and enter the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean that if you don't forgive, God's not forgiving. That's not a this for that statement. What it is, it is a statement to help us to understand that if you and I have the awareness of our sin and God forgives us of our sin, then it bursts in us a spirit of forgiving. And Jesus just simply says, those of us who are forgiven will be forgiving. Those of us who have received mercy will be merciful. The next is the pure in heart. You see, to be helpful, we must be those who give forgiveness and mercy. We also must be those who are people of integrity. I want you to listen to me, church. Integrity, it's something that is missing in our world today. Isn't it obvious to you, as I think it is to me, that when I hear something, I almost immediately approach it with skepticism. It amazes me how the culture of today can put church and how they live for God in one place and then go over in another place and live completely ungodly. How folks can come and worship and live here and go and be people who live in the world. And I don't mean just in it. I mean like the world. And there seems to be no sense of awareness that they're into. It's that compartmentalizing that's become a part of our culture. And I want you to know when God calls you, he calls you to have integrity, to be the same in the same place all the time because God has set you apart to be what? His living word. So when you're in those places where the world and others act and talk and do differently, you can be seen as one who both lives and speaks and sings. One fellow was... Asked by some of his cohorts, why is it you're always humming Christian music? I thought, praise God. <laughs> I mean, his heart, his thought, his life, his way is such that it inspires the very humming and music of his voice. Living words. God wants to do a great work in this church, and he is going to do it. It's just questioned whether he's going to do it through us or through another generation. You see, he wants to do it in you and I. But we have to be his living word, giving forgiveness, walking in integrity. And it says the pure in heart will what? Will see God. Now, I want you to know we're never going to see God in his totality. But we'll see the sensibleness of God at work in us and at work in our world. And it will be a tremendous blessing. The third thing is, is it says we need to be helpful not only by giving in integrity, but by taking action. Blessed are the peacemakers. They are God's children. You know, I've had people say before, you're just like your mother. Now, a lot of times when that's said, that means we are, in some way, adapting their negative behaviors. In fact, I think when we talk about that to one another or within our homes or especially between couples when, you know, uh, I, I might even say to, to my wife, her mother's name is Bobby, I said, oh, is Bobby here today? <laughs> uh, you know, and she doesn't like that. And, and I knew she wouldn't like it when I said it. It wasn't the right thing for me to say. But I know I'm not alone in doing that. You're acting like this person or like that. But when we're called to be acting like God's children, that means that people see in us the very heart and desire of God enacted in our life. And he says that peacemaking, 
What does it mean? It doesn't mean to be passive. It means to do the loving thing that brings order and rightness in life. That's why when Jesus said, if you have an order against a brother, go to him and tell Don't tell everybody else. Go to that person. And how do you, how do you go? You go alone. Because why? Your motive is to win back whatever is fractured. And then once you've done that, if it doesn't work, get two other or three other people who have that same heart to redeem the fracture and bring back harmony and then go with them. And if not, come to the church. I've been a pastor for 40 years and I've yet to see, I've yet to see it come to that where it comes before the church. And then we wonder why we have difficulty in the body of Christ. But you see, the Lord has called us to be peacemakers, and sometimes that means doing the hard thing. And it's difficult, and everybody doesn't understand it, and, and, and it, it has a price tag. Well, we're helpful when we're forgiving and merciful, when we practice integrity, when we take action. And then it says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This is dying for the cause of being right wise. Are you willing to stand and to die for what's right? You know, I listen to campaign ads by uh, people on both sides, and, and I'm not picking on one side or the other. It was just such a contradiction to me. And, and I hear on the one, one side, I'm for children of all ages, no matter who they are, where they come, and, what, and yet that same person is an advocate supporter of exterminating unborn children. I have trouble with that. There are some things that should bother us, and we should be willing to die for the right cause. And it says if you are, you have the rule and reign of God in your life. You have the blessedness. You have the peace and joy. And I think of Paul and Silas who've been beaten by a rod within the next stroke being enough to take their life. That's what that kind of beating was about. And now they're in a hole in a first century prison, in the hole in the worst place in the prison. And what are these two men doing? They're singing. Why? Because they don't hurt. Absolutely not. They've almost been beaten to death. Are they in a pleasant place? No. Can you imagine the stench of being in a hole in a first century prison? And yet they are rejoicing and praising God because they have joy. And one of the great persons who had the ability to be of godly character, in fact, it was a man after God's own heart, when he got in a place where his sin and the things of his life robbed him of that, he prayed and he pleaded, God, restore to me what? The joy of my salvation. Maybe some of you here today need that joy. You need it back. You need to be confident. You need to be certain. You need to be sure. Helpful. Helpful in dying. And then finally, helpful in this last. Blessed are you. When people insult you. Do any of y'all enjoy being insulted? I never have personally taken a liking to that. When people insult you, when they persecute you, and say false things of all kinds of evil against you because of me, then he says rejoice. It's helpful to the kingdom and the living word of God in the midst of men, folks, when we forgive, when we walk in integrity, when we take action to be right, when we're willing to die for the right cause, and even when we're accused, when we're doing those things, we still give God the praise and the glory. And he says, in that there will be joy. Joy is an eternal peace that's free of outside circumstances. Like Paul and Silas, it doesn't matter what takes place in the occurrences of our life, it's what's taking place in the inner sanction of the heart of our life. Nine steps, nine things humility, holiness, helpful behavior that make us godly in character. B.H. Carroll 
was one of the greatest preachers and theologians of the last century. He founded the largest theological training center in the world for men and women called to ministry. The Southern Baptist Theological, no, the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He had a British companion and Christian come to speak on his invitation at this great school. Brought him into his home, fed him a good meal, saw that he was put to bed with all of the things of custom. And then at night when everyone was resting, he went to check to be sure everything was fine. And as he passed, he came out and he saw two shoes sitting outside his door. He realized it was British custom that when you went to bed at night, if you were a person of importance, you put your shoes outside the door and one of the servants would come around, take those shoes, polish them for the events of your day the next day. So B.H. Carroll quickly picked up the man's shoes. He hurried to the kitchen and he turned on the lights. He got out the shoe polish and the brushes and he began to intensely put what we used to call where I grew up a spit shine on those shoes. While he was doing the polishing, for whatever reason, the man got up and he came to the kitchen for a drink of water or some need he had, and he found B.H. Carroll, this great theologian and preacher and founder of a tremendous institution at which he had the great privilege of speaking, polishing his shoes. He says, you need to stop that. He says, oh, no, no. You know, Christ called us to be servants. And it's my privilege to polish your shoes. Folks, what a difference it would make in life if we treated others that way. If we had that godly character in nature that made people, when they saw who we are and how we live, say, that person must belong to God. Ever been around a holy person? I've been around a few in my life. You know who's most unaware of their holiness? The holy person. Why? Because they're humble. Because they're holy and their greatest desire in life is to serve. Lord, when did you see us doing all these things? Visiting the sick and feeding the hungry and giving water and doing... He says, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Does your life exemplify godly character? Maybe like me, you and I still need a little work. God's willing to help us. Let's be men and women of godly character. Amen? Amen.